let people uh, unmute themselves and, and speak on Zoom. Yeah, because okay. we're going to try to have more of a discussion. Raise your hand. Ah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right, everyone, welcome to those of you who are here and online as well. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a different session today because we're going to try to make this more of a discussion. Um, I'm going to be joined by Scott and Magnus uh, a little bit later. Uh, they both had conflicts, unfortunately. Um, so the first half, we're going to talk a little bit more on the technical side about how we can work together to support innovation and, and extension of DHS2 uh, and make it easier and, and, and more cost effective to, to build those types of extensions. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the financing and the business model side when, when Magnus and Scott join um, in the second half of the session. Um, to start off, uh, I wanted to uh, have something that's a little bit engaging and, and please the people that are on Zoom, please join us as well. Um, I'm going to have this Mentimeter. So if you're familiar with Mentimeter, I'll get this out of the way. If you're familiar with Mentimeter, uh, hopefully this can stay out of the way. Um, go to menti.com on your personal device and you will see the, uh, uh, basically you'll enter the code that's at the top of this screen. And then we'll have a few questions. Um, just to get a, a feel for, for different uh, people's experience with uh, building on top of DHIS2, what you're, what you're working on building. Um, and I might even add some custom questions towards the end as we, as we uh, work through the discussion. But to start off, just to, to get everybody warmed up, put uh, on this map, which is the, uh, the Peter's project projection of uh, uh, the world, uh, where you come from. Um, and while you're doing that, this projection is great because it's uh, equal area. So every country is represented proportionally to all the other countries, as opposed to the Mercator projection, which overemphasizes the uh, North American continent and the poles a bit. Um, but it also looks kind of funny. So sorry about that. All right, we've got a few people coming in. Great, thank you. Wait, a, wait another couple moments here. Um, so because this is going to be a bit of a discussion, I also would like to invite everyone to think about a, a discussion topic that you would like to bring up um, or something that you have struggled with or open questions that you have around sustainability of extensions and innovation in DHS2, customizing it, particularly sharing those extensions um, or, or applications as it might be. Um, and there's a kind of a theme that we'll talk a little bit about through through all of this, which is there there is a choice that you that all of us have to make as we're customizing DHS two is do we do we build and invest in one particular local context and you can build an application that follows exactly the pattern that you that you want to enforce or that you're that you're uh, to match your local context or your local use case. But then you know, that's very difficult to share that. And so then if somebody else has to do that somewhere else, they have to go through that whole process again. Um, and so there's always kind of a choice between do you build for the local context in, in kind of a microcosm or do you build something more generic, which maybe takes more effort up front, but then has uh, potential cost savings or, or uh, benefits to the larger community. Uh, and what are your... Uh, incentives and, and, and goals in, in choosing between those two things. So I'm gonna move on to the second question here. It looks like we've got uh, some European representation, some African representation, Asian, and I'm sad that we don't have Latin America here, but some, some US as well. Um, also, I, I'll put myself, I, I can't put myself on here. I'd have to get my phone out, but I'm on the West Coast of the US originally, and then Europe. So um, fill that in a little bit. Here we go to the next one. Okay, so I put in some things that have to do with building applications or, or innovations, local apps on DHS2, uh, on top of DHS2 as a platform. These are not everything that you have to consider, but 
between these, can you rate, rate them each between very easy, meaning that you don't even have to really think about it, uh, probably none of these you don't, you don't have to think about at all, but maybe, um, to very difficult. So that means that it's, it's something that is so daunting that maybe you don't even want to want to consider it or want to do it. Interesting. So yeah, please fill in each of these uh, bars uh, and we'll see what the, what the averages are in just a minute. Ooh. It's a tough, tough race. I'm not sure if I can see how many people have responded. Ah, there we go, down in the corner. All right. Uh, understandably, it looks like financing is in the lead, um, which will be the second half here. Um, but they're all they're all actually fairly fairly even, um, which which is an interesting uh, dynamic. I kind of thought that that, that we would have a, a very clear winner here. So we'll come back and and discuss this in uh, in a little bit. Maybe it's just hard to estimate what's very difficult and what's very easy. Okay, so just to get a, a feel for the audience here, who. And and when I say you in this case, it could be your organization. It doesn't have to be you personally. But who here has built a DHS two web application as your as your application uh, or as your organization? Okay. All right. No Angular fans in the audience. I like this. Oh, very even once again. Okay, we have one one person who's built something uh, using uh, who didn't use the app platform. Two people. Okay, interesting. We'll we'll have a discussion about that. If you if you answered the second point here, um, I will ask you to speak up in a little bit. So uh, if you don't mind, um, so get ready. And people on Zoom, we will have the opportunity as well for uh, you to join this discussion. So uh, um, if you would like to contribute to the discussion, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, and Alejandro will be able to um, uh, un unmute you, give you the opportunity to unmute yourself, I suppose. Okay, so uh, pretty um, pretty evenly split here between yes, uh, and we use the app platform to know, uh, but we will in the future, and uh, no whatsoever. Um, interesting. So now we're going to have the same question, but for Android applications. So this is uh, something that maybe is is a little bit less common, but can be quite powerful if you uh, build custom data entry, uh, is supporting offline data entry um, using uh, Android, um, or I should have said maybe mobile application. Um, so let's, yeah, let's, let's update this in real time to be, have you built a mobile application interacting with DHS2? Uh, obviously, if you have built one that is not on Android, you have not used the Android SDK. So that would be your answer in that case. All right, we have a few people who have built applications, mobile apps. Cool. Again, I might uh, call on you to uh, share your experience here um, in a in a few minutes. And then this is a, a free form text. So in this case, if you've built an application, if you think about thinking about building an application in the future, if you're thinking about extending DHS2 in some way, so building some sort of functionality outside of what it can do out of the box, what are you building? Um, just tell us generally what what is that? Is it a um, maybe a new a way to configure DHS2 in a custom way? Maybe it's a um, uh maybe it's a way to import data from an external system maybe it is a uh custom data entry application for a particular workflow that you want to optimize for um outbreak management for example um yeah interesting all right so feel free to fill these in um for those of you who are joining us uh we're using mentimeter just to get some get people kind of warmed up this will be more of a discussion 
Um, so feel free to think about what you want to contribute to that discussion. Um, and you can join the Mentimeter uh, poll on, on your phone or your computer, menti.com, with that code at the top there. OK, this is quite, quite interesting. Metadata packages, interesting. I'm going to give give people a little bit more time to to write through this one. Tracker to aggregate tooling. Emergency pilot. I'm curious what that is. All right, I'll give uh, 10, 10 or 20 more seconds to put in what you, uh, ooh, geo validation tool. I would like to like to discuss that one, whoever whoever put that in. So, all right, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> uh, whatever we can't do in DHS too, snarky, but I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got 18 people in here. So we'll 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 leave it at that. We'll come back and discuss some of these points in a in a minute as well. Uh, and I wanted to quote Pete Linnigan saying that making apps in DHS two got fifty times easier with the app platform, um, which he told me in the in the hallway the other day, which I I thought was quite uh, quite a, a vote of confidence. So thank you, Pete. <laughs> um, all right, so let's look at um, let's look at some of our answers here, if we can, um, and maybe I just. Got rid of them, but I hope not. All right, let's let's go ahead and look look at some of our answers here. Um, and for for those of you who uh, who joined a little bit late, I'm not sure if you can go back and see the um the previous questions. But if you weren't able to answer them live, uh, you can still contribute to the discussion. So, uh. We're going to try to make this a bit more of a discussion and, and hear from hear from all of you about how uh, how you're extending DHS to the challenges that you face. First half is going to be more on the technical side, second half more on the the financing and business model side. When Scott and Magnus will will join me, um, so right now we're talking a little bit more on the technical side of what what challenges you face and how you how we as a whole community can work together to make it easier and, and more efficient to build these applications. Um, okay, cool. So people can can put in their, their answers uh, still on this question. Um, so I wanna uh, highlight this uh, second bar here. Yes, but we didn't use the app platform. Um, so can it, it, anybody who, who answered that question uh, and, and answered the question with that answer. Can you raise your hand and, uh, yeah, okay, great. Um, can you tell us why and what 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 caused you to make that decision? Yeah, we, we have a microphone here. And feel free to raise your hand if you're on Zoom to contribute to the discussion as well. You introduce yourself too, if you'd like. Introduce yourself too, if you'd like. Ivan Quintana from ICT. Uh... Yeah, basically for us, and yeah, okay. Yeah, for us it was uh, a couple of things, and probably Alexis over there that is uh, the developer can explain a little bit more in detail. But basically, it doesn't fit too much into our current architecture that we are using clean architecture. So the kind of hooks that you have uh, that you have is use date and these kind of things were a little bit difficult to fit into our architecture. Um, then from very long time, we also have like an a library to communicate with DHIS, D2 API. So it was about throwing it away and using something new that is always a little bit painful. <laughs> uh, we also have like a library of component. Mm -hmm. a little bit first component that was D2 component. Same thing, it was like after a lot of work. Um, then we are also a little bit scared because we are using TypeScript mm -hmm. and you tend to use, I know that that platform is TypeScript as well, but you tend mm -hmm. to use Flow in general. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit scary to, <laughs> to do this kind of movement when you have invested a little bit of time. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to to address that last that last point specifically, that's maybe a little bit on the technical side for 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 the audience here. But um, we do support TypeScript. We, I think we would like to think more about how how people would like to use that build types into our into our library. I was talking to to Hendrik about that the other day, as well. Um, to to basically make it easier to use with TypeScript. And we do use Flow only in one application, I believe, in, in the capture application. In in all of our other applications, it's just JavaScript at the moment. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, that, that's also what for us. It's like we move into typing everything. Yeah. Like, sorry. I, I move, we move into typing everything like a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it has been like a game changing for us, like uh, in terms of testing. Otherwise, you need to have like a very good yeah. team for testing. And yeah. we are not that big. So to, yeah. to have everything type is, is particularly useful for for us to detect like changes errors and this kind of thing sure yeah uh, like, the capture app is also moving to typescript from flow as well um it's a, it's a longer effort though uh, alexis i don't know if you maybe want to add something else and this is getting maybe a little bit technical but i think it's interesting to hear the uh um yeah people's opinions and i think what what i'd like to see come out of this particularly is we we all are in in this together right and we can all communicate more and 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 talk about where where those challenges are where we see the challenge of like this introduction of this new tool which maybe for some people makes things a lot easier might also require or or seem to require you to rewrite a lot of things that you already have or or to re-implement things and that's not what we want so we we need to talk uh, all of us, the whole community, more about that so that we can address those because there might be ways that we as a community can also make it the transition or the migration path easier so that it's it, it ends up in, in the right place. So, well, actually, uh, ICT began do, um, building web applications for React. Uh, more closer? Okay, yeah. Uh, ICT began uh, building React applications maybe five years ago with the user extended app. So uh, there was no application platform yet uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we already had like a way to go and to build applications and mm -hmm. our library components, et cetera. In the recent applications, we have tried to use the tool UI, the new mm -hmm. UI library. And uh, it's been quite great, quite not because of TypeScript, yeah. because uh, we don't have like the type safety, but we have built our own types on top mm -hmm. of it for the, the components that we use. So mm -hmm. we could partially use it. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest drawback has been like uh, the communication. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recall uh, two years or three years ago when you began with the app platform, mm -hmm. we tried to use the use the query and the data query in time. We're too technical, sorry. <laughs> well, guys. <laughs> Come back for the second half when we talk about financing. We actually tried to use the uh, the data engine and the the hooks that you introduced. Yeah, I, I think there's a commit from from me on the original hook be, before using React Query. Yeah, but we were using and um, we were developing D2 API at that time, and D2 yeah. API it's not only about a component being typed; it's yeah. the actual response from the server from the API yeah. that it's being typed. Yeah, yeah. And right now, if we move or we try to use the the hooks, yeah, it's like. Uh, if it's unknown, you need to actually go to the documentation page, the yeah. HTML page, yeah. and check what what's in there instead of having it on your code editor. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's the main problem of using the app platform. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't use it. Mm -hmm. We actually have the provider on top of it. We mm -hmm. use the header bar mm -hmm. there. If we wanted, we could use the use alerts or mm -hmm. the different layouts that you are introducing right now, mm -hmm. or the offline support. But it's difficult for us to embrace it like mm -hmm. full. Yeah, yeah. Those are all things that we've uh, considered and that we have. Uh, we would like to to support better. So typing of uh, responses is is something that's I think particularly interesting, um, and that's something that can be quite a challenge when you uh, are working in a world where an application might talk to multiple versions of DHS two. Um, so that's something that is is a challenge but it's something that would be i think a, a a big benefit going forward okay um and feel free to take it back and not make it a, not make it in in the in the weeds with javascript and typescript because uh 
we we could go on for a long time quite possibly um there was another answer up here do you want to share the mic real quick Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Hayden from Oriel Global Health. Um, I don't actually have a really interesting answer for this one. It's just that okay. um, <laughs> it was more just a case of um, time frame, mm -hmm. and I'm absolutely going to be using the app platform in the future, but mm -hmm. um, we had to get something out quickly, and I just didn't have time to familiarize myself with it at the time. But, Fair enough. you know, it's all going to move over there, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm looking forward to having something on your store one day and have yeah. hopefully people using it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. Great. Yeah. Look forward to it as well. Anyone else have a, a comment here? It, if you, it, even if you answered a different answer to this question I just, and would like to contribute to the discussion, totally fine. So would anyone else like to share anything about development of web apps in DHS2? That's okay too. All right, so now we're going to talk about Android applications, which is much fewer. Um, but I'd like to actually ask the question here, whether you answered yes with, with the Android SDK or without the SDK, not talking about that at the moment, but what, what did you find appealing about making a, a, a mobile app or an Android application? And how did that serve your use case particularly? Um, so was it the offline capability, the mobile form factor, the, the device that that maybe frontline health workers already had with them. Uh, why why was that an attractive thing? So to, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom or in the room here. Uh, if you have built an Android application, if you think you might want to build an Android application in the future, uh, why why would you do that? Why would it be interesting? Anyone else? Okay, we can go start with you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have basically built like two different kind of Android application. Yeah. One of them are simply forks mm -hmm. from the official Android application, mm -hmm. where we basically implement like kind of, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> where we basically implement like kind of shortcuts uh, that help like uh, for clients that are not used to DHIS, uh, mm -hmm. that help them use DHIS. Basically, I don't know, like a screen that you come into the app and the first thing that you have is a way of scanning a barcode yeah. and then you go straight into the regular uh, flow mm -hmm. let's say and the other kind of application are mainly related to logistic before mm -hmm. uh, the android official app was capable of scanning barcode and this kind mm -hmm. of things we were working with uh, some clients with psi and so on mm -hmm. on basically a scanning a pharmacy stock and this kind of stuff so mm -hmm. it's mainly this is the typical use case for us. And then why, why uh, you, because the Android application was already there was the reason that you chose the Android platform rather than a web app, for example, in some of those use cases? For the use case, because it's basically isolated area, a lot yeah. of like capabilities, as you said. And yeah. when it is about logistic, it's usually more useful to have an, a, a mobile phone yeah. than, than a laptop. Yeah, exactly. And then also like a few years ago, it was about the analytics capability. Like they yeah. wanted to have charts yeah. And it was not there already. So yeah. It's yeah. Very useful. Any, anyone else want to contribute to that discussion? Are we not, not Android fans in this room? It seems like. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Thanks. I'm going to repeat that for the, for the people on Zoom. But um, basically said that uh haven't done it yet but would do it for the same reason uh which is uh, offline capability i think the, the the logistics use case is a really interesting one um, and that's something that our lmis team has has been putting a lot of thought into um because when you receive a shipment of a commodity or a, a drug of some some kind and you don't want to manually enter the barcode number into you into dhis2 you can actually just scan that it automatically fills out all of the information that then has check thumbs to make sure that it's actually entered correctly and all of these different things um, has offline capability. Another very interesting use case there um, is uh, text to speech or speech to text. Sorry. So it, rather than uh, 
going through and, and looking at your stock and how many you have left and then going over to your computer and typing in and then going over or, or your Android phone and typing in the number, you could actually just say paracetamol five units or something. And that would actually enter that information into, into the system. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting potential for innovation there in the mobile space. Okay, so this one's gonna be, uh, gonna be interesting. So this is what people are building on top of uh, DHS2 as a platform. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, um, examples here. If, if there's something that you'd specifically like to share or discuss, and particularly if you have questions for the core team, but also more, maybe even more importantly for the rest of the community here um, about what you're building, about how, what other people's experiences have been building something similar, or if other people would be interested in that same thing. Let's, let's talk about that. Um, so I'm going to open it up. I think it was the geo, uh, yeah. Um, geo validation tool, which I think is a, is an, an interesting one. That's a little bit different than some of these others. So we'll start there and then anyone else, uh, get, get your comments prepared so that you can raise your hand after. Hi. Yeah. Um, so um, we uh, we've done a lot of like uh, disease specific assessment for NTDs, and uh, during the data collection process, they take you know the 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 uh, latitude and longitude of where they're doing their survey, and then they uh, you know collate all that data and give it to us, and we bulk upload it into a uh, into our instance. Um, and what we found when we then started mapping that information is that, you know, most of the data was great, but occasionally you'd end up with like three or four surveys that were in a hotel outside of the IU that they claimed the survey was done in. And uh, obviously that started raising questions about the validity of that data point and things like that. So um, we did some searching to see if there was any way of sort of va uh, validating that data within DHIS2. And there are a few questions on the community um that didn't seem to say there was anything there and i know that who had in their bulk upload tool apparently they did have this feature but that's since been removed because it wasn't reliable so um what we've done is like just build some scripts that basically do this outside of dhis2 uh, and that's fine for our purposes at the moment but you know if you start doing this on a huge scale it just becomes really um a pain to do so uh, the plan would be obviously to build an application that can either check data before you put it into DHIS2 or target a data set or some events or a tracker and essentially just look at where that data, what IU that data claims to reside in and then look at a, a data element like a geo data element and just run a little uh, point in poly check to see if it sits there or not. And then um, what we've done for you know, our, our purposes is build like a, a very, very dirty little website that you basically put these incorrect um, values in and it just shows you the point where uh, the uh, the data says the uh, the event took place and the IU that it claims to be in and you can just correct it and you can like do a little search, uh, you know, for the, do a, uh, I can't remember what it's called, a, uh, an address lookup and actually sort of see where it should be and, and it just makes it easier to, to do this because a, a lot of the time you send this data back and you go, these, these geo coordinates are wrong. And they're like, well, how do I fix that? And you go, go on Google Earth and find where it is. And, you know, and there might be 50 or 60 of these. So, yeah, um, I've done some asking around. I don't think anyone else is doing it. And I don't want to repeat work that other people have done. But so far, I think I might have an original idea. So <laughs> I don't know. Has anyone else had this problem and are they working on it? <laughs> Is it no? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can hear me. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, Is his idea original? <laughs> has anyone else done, <laughs> has anyone else done uh, or, or run into issues with um, basically validation or, or uh, quality of, of geographic data in DHS2? So that might be org units, the org unit hierarchy itself, which can be a pain to manage. And there are that same exact uh, problem can be uh, found in facilities that are maybe their their location, their point is outside of the district that they claim to be in, the, the, the bounds of the district that they claim to be in. And if you have 500,000 facilities in your, in your org unit, 
tree. It could be very difficult to do manually, but being able to have an automated way to to validate that could be quite interesting, as well as events and tracked entities as well. Is that something that anybody else has encountered as a problem or uh, would be interested in in seeing if it's a problem in their own systems? Raise, raise of hands if it's interesting. You don't have to speak. It's okay. No one. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, cool. Interesting. Um, and we don't, yeah, no, no hands online. I think that's quite an interesting, interesting use case, and it sounds like something that could be uh, could be of use to 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 the larger community, to, in in my mind at least. Um, so look, looking forward to seeing where where that goes. Um, I asked you to prepare things, Vincent. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of have questions. There may be comments and questions in two areas, both you know the web, the web. Uh, the web apps and the Android app. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to the web app, uh, I think even somebody mentioned the challenge of you know having to move from whatever they were using before to sort of follow the standards that are yeah. there, yeah. and it's really quite painful. Yeah. And especially for example, for us, we built an entire ecosystem around you know Angular applications and yeah. you know, transforming that into uh, into React, for example, has been really painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. One approach that we took, we, we sort of thought that maybe, you know, frameworks change here and there. So we sort of decided to kind of come up with a more, more of a native way of mm -hmm. handling things such that if anybody is using any other framework, they can tap into that uh, mm -hmm. uh, structure, let's say, mm -hmm. without having to worry about, okay, this is React, this is Angular and things like that. So we've mm -hmm. sort of started creating like a, a JavaScript vanilla mm -hmm. kind of thing which you can port anywhere in Angular or mm -hmm. in React. That in itself has been painful regardless, mm -hmm. uh, although we are trying to, to move in that direction so that you know anybody in the community wants to sort of use whatever tools they want to use, it's easier to tap into that. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, now therein comes the question. Uh, right now we are looking into, you know, Porting the visualizations, you know, in the dashboard, the maps, and all of that, sort of create a vanilla type, uh, mm -hmm. uh, vanilla type of framework. I would say, although I wouldn't call it framework, uh, into that uh, we call it D two visualizer. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have the same name. Mm -hmm. So the D D two visualizer sort of ports all of those, you know, mm -hmm. small features, you know, chats and all of that. Uh, in native JavaScript, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're wondering if, for example, we could get you know reusable components from the you know dashboards and all of that, so we can put them in there. And if anybody wants to use them in whatever you know, whatever they are building or whatever, they can easily uh, take it from there and you know mm -hmm. build anything fast from there. Mm -hmm. So that is one. Two. Uh, and maybe you've noticed we we sort of. Uh, adopted Flutter as a mobile uh, approach into developing apps uh, mm -hmm. in, in Tanzania. And I was wondering whether you guys are sort of looking into, uh, you know, diversifying uh, into, you know, mobile platforms depending on use cases, because in our mm -hmm. end, for example, there are use cases where you, you sort of have to create, create apps for both platforms and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, I think to to address the f the first one, um, which was around uh, framework independent um, uh, use of, in particular, visualizations or imbe embedding visualizations in in whatever website or framework, um, that is definitely something that we're uh, thinking about in in the plugin encapsulation basically logic that we that we have. Um, I think there's maybe some different nuances to uh, to your question as well, because there's one part is, how do you actually build those visualizations themselves? So build the, the, the SVGs in the browser with the interaction and all of those types of things. And then how do you embed one of those visualizations, maybe that's a, just like you have already on the, on the dashboard, embed one of those visualizations, whether it's a chart from the data visualizer app or a map for the maps app or a custom visualization that someone else has developed, how do you embed that into some other, some other system? Um, and the embedding part is something that we're thinking a lot about right now with the work towards building secure and sandboxed encapsulated plugins 
that can be embedded in, in different systems. So what that sort of means is we're, right now we have a kind of a hodgepodge of ways that the plugins are embedded into the dashboard. Um, and most of them are just pulling in additional JavaScript and, and rendering it into the React application that is the, um, the dashboard. Rather than doing that, uh, we're moving to a model where we encapsulate that in a way that tries to sandbox it uh, and allows it to have to do whatever it wants inside of that sandbox. So that could be Angular, it could be React, it could be whatever. Uh, there's no requirement across the border that they use the same framework. Um, and that also gives us a really interesting advantage uh, when it comes to app specific permissions, which is something that is some, on, on the roadmap that we'd like to introduce, where when you install an application, ideally you should be able to grant that application specific permissions and not other permissions. So if you install a rich text editor plugin for your dashboard, you want to be able to tell DHS2 not to let that rich text editor delete metadata, for example. Um, and that's something that will significantly, I think, improve the um, the trust that can be placed in third-party applications. Um, and part of that also comes with the advantage of being able to encapsulate and then embed those visualizations in, in whatever other framework you, you might have. So React could be the, the framework on the outside. It could be Angular. It could be vanilla JavaScript. It could be Svelte. It could be whatever you want. Um, I don't know if that answered your question specifically, but did that help? I would very much like to look at the code. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we, we won't pull it up here now, but <laughs> another time. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, and that's that's a work in progress. So that's not something that is uh, in the the application platform or the or the um, the tooling that we do today. Um, and then the second question was around uh, multi-platform applications and specifically the use of Flutter. Um, the approach that we've taken to that is basically to support PWA applications in our in our web framework. So being able to basically PWA for those of you who aren't familiar is progressive web app. It's basically a um, a web app in your browser, but then you can install it as a as a kind of lightweight app on your mobile application. Uh, it can have offline support. It can be installed also on on the desktop browser and things like that. Um, there are some usability trade-offs in using that versus using something that's native or something like Flutter. Um, but that gives us the ability basically to turn any web application into a, a cross-platform um, application. Um, in terms of mobile apps and the Android SDK specifically, that is Android specific. Um, I think there is in, in the Android team, I wish someone from the Android team was here today to, to answer that question more in more in depth, uh, maybe Marta or, or Jose. But the decision to go with Android was to give the best possible experience to the most number of users. Um, so that's where the, the choice of the Android platform was made. Um, and I think there is uh, interest in, in expanding that to, to multiple platforms and reusing code across that. But right now, it's Android specific. OK, um, thank you for the question. Uh, and we can talk about code later. Anyone else have a, a comment on, on things that they're building on top of DHS2? It doesn't have to be technical, again, remember. It could be use case uh, focused. Um, something that they're building on here or, or something that they see on here that they didn't, maybe they didn't uh, put in themselves that, that strikes them as interesting. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and contribute to that discussion. Going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to pick one, um, and then and then we'll move on to the next uh, fun activity that we have planned. Um, so, new data entry app and facility attributes app. Um, can I can I ask someone to fess up and and say that they they entered that? Who 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 is that? Yeah, are you willing to talk about it? Okay, <laughs> you you can say no. That's okay, but I'm I'm curious. Let's let's get the mic uh, somewhere. Yeah.
Hi, my name is David. I uh, support the PEPFAR program, the Datum Instance, uh, or the Datum, which is the DHI student instance for mm -hmm. PEPFAR. And we're starting to talk about a new data entry app um, because even though the HTML forms are really dynamic and we've really pushed boundaries around there, um, we do know and acknowledge that the data entry burden is very great. And so we want to start exploring um, maybe a custom app that may address uh, some of those issues and kind of revamp it to maybe also be more manageable just because everything changes every year. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is in very early stages. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are talking about facility attributes because um, just because the instance is so large, um, we do not want to open up permissions to the maintenance app to mm -hmm. have um, facility attributes such as is this public private uh, combination university mm -hmm. uh, what are the hours you know just things like that because um, there is starting to be a uh, desire for analyzing that type of data with the types of facilities where mm -hmm. PEPFAR is supporting and so um, we're thinking of building a attributes app that will limit the permissions but allow that type of update mm -hmm. um, it'll be a big lift at the beginning but we're also hoping that um you know as because um, we I know, I know like an OU hierarchy will never be stable but mm -hmm. with the uh, facility attributes app we want to be able to have a few people within each OU add those types of attributes mm -hmm. without having broader permission permissions to mm -hmm. uh, uh, mess other things up potentially. So yeah. those are some of the use cases we have and we're considering. Um, yeah. Another one I added, but I didn't see it up there is um, we actually did just put together a, a dashboard management app. Yeah. Um, after several years, the amount of dashboards, just curated dashboards that PEPFAR puts out mm. for the field has grown exponentially and mm. it's actually can be really hard to navigate and find. Um, and so we're planning to submit it back to the mm. DHIS2 app hub, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very small, quick custom app um, that's just like a dashboard landing page that we can now force our users um, to, and then they can use that to uh, easily like filter, like I want this time period, these data sets, and then go to the dashboards that have been created for them, as opposed to mm -hmm. trying to read through every single little dashboard that's in the drop down on the page. So. Just a few of the things we're doing. Interesting, yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll comment quickly on the dashboard management app because I think that might be something that could be could be quite useful to a, to a lot of different people. Um, but then, yeah. Presentation yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and then and maybe Hendrik, I don't know if I'll put you on the spot to 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 comment after that on the anything about the new data entry app or yeah yeah yeah. Um, so first on the dashboard management app, which you just mentioned, I think that's something that it kind of ties in with the facility. Um, uh, the facility, I, I see some parallels to the facility attributes app as well. It's it's kind of the opposite direction, right? Rather than delegating the creation of things down, you're you're kind of centralizing it up to the, uh, in in datum at least to to the the creation of those dashboards. And I think that's a um, uh, a pattern that that is not not uncommon um, and could be quite useful to kind of guide people to guide the 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 end users to find where the data that they want to actually see is. Um, and you can create these beautiful dashboards, but if people don't know how to get there um, or they, they can't find it because there are 100 or 50 or 200, that could be, could be quite powerful. Um, the facility on the facility attributes app side, um, and everyone feel free to raise your hand if you want to jump in on any of this because um, I think it's quite interesting, in particular interesting on the use case side. Um, on the facility attributes app, have you have you um, used or played around with any of the new functionality with facility? Uh, it's called uh, facility profile, um, kind of MFL functionality, or uh, the metadata. This is two thirty eight, so it's very very recent. But the metadata proposal. Uh, feature it's it's API only right now, but that might be a an API that could be useful for that application. Basically, where a lower level user could have the option to 
propose a change to a facility, the opening hours, for example, and then that gets approved by someone who actually has the authority to make that change uh, in the maintenance app. Um, otherwise, there might be some changes that we need to think about in terms of the authority that is granted to different users. They might have authority to change the profile for a specific facility only, for example. Is that something you've you've thought about or seen seen some parallels there? I was in a session that was discussed and yeah. I made notes about it. We're still going through all of our QA for Q.2. Yeah. So it's in process and we haven't started building this app yet either. And I think our plan is to explore that with Q.3. So yeah. Yes. yeah, cool. Hendrix, did you want to comment on that? Uh, do you want to use this or the or the mic up there? I don't know if I can take mine off that quickly. Should be on, I think. So this is a Hendrix de Graff, the team lead for the platform team. Yep. Yeah, so with, yeah, so with regards to the data entry app, uh, team and I have been working on a, on a new tool for that. It's been in the planning for the past development cycles. Um, and it's it's going to, the, the fact you mentioned about custom forms is actually one of the things that we want to start doing in a fundamentally different way um, with the plugin system. Um, so yeah, I think it would be great maybe after this if uh, we could link up and, and maybe discuss the requirement because I think it might be beneficial if we find a way to um, yeah address your requirements if possible in the in the core application and perhaps um, yeah have a collaboration on it and see if we can uh, instead of having two data entry apps effectively have one uh, that addresses both problems. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, that that brings us to just a, a more general point where again, let's talk because uh, we're we're working on things at the global team uh, core team level, but also everybody else is working on things. And if we don't talk, we're going to be reinventing the wheel. Um, and so, without any of the technical tools, without any of the the um, uh, financial kind of overlap of things let's stop reinventing the wheel and let's let's talk about how we can how we can solve these problems uh, together and not uh yeah not reinvent that wheel um so we're just having uh, scott welcome uh we're just having a discussion about uh different things around uh extending dhis2 i haven't gotten into the the technical uh, presentation um at all um and we have uh, oh we've been here for what about an hour almost an hour okay um I'm going to turn it over to Scott in a minute to talk about um, sustainability, financial sustainability, and some of that. But first, I wanted to um, quickly uh, show the, the last few slides of the, the plenary session that um, we had the other day, uh, Tuesday, um, to talk about what we're looking at doing at, at, at the core team level to support extensibility. Um, and these are, again, kind of on the technical side. but tie in with a lot of the um uh, yeah supporting a lot of those innovations and making it easier and cheaper to build and maintain and then share and use those applications um so to get into some some specifics um i mentioned public portals the other day um can i just see a show of hands who here has thought about or used public portals to give the public access to dhs2 data data that's collected in dhs2 raise your hands yeah Six or seven people. Okay, um, so that's a, a use case that comes up quite frequently. It was especially popular during COVID to give basically the public real time access to case numbers um, in public portals. But there are a lot of technical challenges around how do you actually do that in a performant way? How do you do that in, in a way that you don't need to build up your own visualizations? Maybe you want to embed the visualizations that DHS2 provides out of the box in this public portal, maybe you uh, want to dump that data somewhere else. So there's a lot of questions about how that how that is done. 
Uh, and there are other uh, examples of this as well, such as integration applications that we see over and over where, uh, as I mentioned, uh, data is downloaded from DHS2 into the browser and then pushed to some external system or vice versa. Um, and thinking about uh, creating documentation and uh, kind of good practice guides for how to how we should do that as a as a community. What the best way to build a public portal or build an uh, integration with an external system is in the DHS2 space. Um, community engagement and support and developer advocacy is a continued uh, area of investment for us. Um, we have a developer advocate. We also have uh, the, the core team is very uh, focused on trying to engage with the community of developers. That's several hundred people now on our developer Slack workspace, for example. Um, and there's a lot of efforts going into building uh, academies for fundamentals of building uh, extensions and applications on DHS2, but also uh, digging into the more advanced use cases and, and uh, um, technical uh, requirements for those uh, developers in that community. Um, that's the ex advanced DHS2 extension development academies, for example. Um, and then the, there's, I think, a burgeoning new uh, area of um, collaboration with design labs. Um, the UIO design lab uh, we've collaborated with for a long time, but there's new ones such as the University of Dar es Salaam and others who are really pushing the boundaries of what DHS2 can do and, and, and uh, thinking about how to, how to really be innovative and, and move things forward. Um, and I think there's a lot of room for collaboration between the core team, those innovation centers, and the, the global community as well. So now a little bit more on the, on the maybe more technical side. We won't get into all of these details, um, but you, many of you are familiar with the App Hub. Um, maybe you found it useful to see what other people have built, maybe downloaded an application, maybe used it, maybe you've built an application and uploaded it there. Um, there's a lot of things that it can do and that it, it, it enables, but there's also a lot of room for improvement um, and what we can provide as that kind of infrastructure for sharing these extensions. Uh, I mentioned earlier um, uh, per application permissions. So that's something that's kind of a core DHS2 feature, but it's also something that would be beneficial on the App Hub. Um, but more on the community side of the App Hub is how do we increase the ability of people to get visibility into the, uh, the sustainability of these applications? And how do we let the developers use the App Hub as a tool to in improve the sustainability of their applications or their extensions? So I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more in an, on the next slide about um, app feedback, use of statistics and error reporting. I think that's something that's very, very interesting. Um, obviously, there are um, considerations that need to be taken to make sure that that's uh, opt-in from, from a user of an application, for example. So you don't want to automatically collect analytics or, or error reports, but really streamlining the ability for somebody that's using an application to communicate with the developer of that application or that extension, uh, and particularly when there's technical errors or, or feedback from the users of that application to be able to feed that back to the developer. Um, similarly, support for other types of uh, extensions components than just applica uh, web applications. So Android apps, being able to uh, view different Android apps that have been developed to deploy those to a DHS2 instance through the App Hub uh, to support uh, more strict versioning of those applications, those Android applications through uh, basically a uh, in DHS2 distribution mechanism, um, metadata packages being something that uh, we have kind of, there are files that you can download and install now, but that could be something that could be uh, significantly uh, streamlined and improved um, through something like the App Hub or a metadata hub to be able to say, I want to download this package. These are the configuration options that I need to set to actually configure that package for installation into my system. Uh, I then want to know which version I already have installed, what customizations I've made, so that when I upgrade that uh, to a later version of that package of HIV surveillance or, or COVID surveillance or COVID vaccination, 
um, I can reapply those customizations. Uh, and there's some other um, additional things here. Beta deployment of applications um, is something that we're looking at, particularly for core applications, to be able to get pre-releases out into the wild and get feedback earlier in the process by allowing people to install beta versions of those applications and then uh, test them and give feedback, uh, even if they already have a production version uh, that they have installed and they want to keep most of their users using that production version, they can test it with certain uh, subgroups of users. That is an incomplete slide apparently. Um, so this is improvements to the app-based extensions that we have today. Um, I think that events should actually be under larger architectural changes. I'm not sure why that got up there. Um, we talked about plugin extension points um, here. Uh, I guess, yeah, the, the, I'll, I'll talk about the events in a minute. Talk, talk about plugin extension points and kind of encapsulation of plugins, but there's also uh, a need for additional places where you can put those plugins. So right now you can put plugins on the dashboard and that's basically it. But there are a lot of cases where you might want to just add a little something to the capture application or to the um, uh, data entry application to be able to customize that functionality without forking the whole entire app or creating your own app for that, for that use case. So a good example of that is in the capture application, we have what's called, and this is the, the new tracker functionality within the capture application. We have what's called a tracked entity dashboard, uh, which is giving you an overview of a particular patient or tracked entity. Um, and then you can drill down into the, the different programs that they're enrolled in or the different events that, they, that have taken place. But on that, um, on that dashboard, you might be able to see, uh, for example, you might wanna see the uh, height over time of a, a child program, for example. So you might wanna see all of the checkups, the, the, the height of that child uh, on a graph. And that could be something that could be built as a standalone extension or standalone plugin and plugged into the capture application so that it doesn't need to be something that's available out of the box. If you have a, something else you want to, to graph over time for specific people that are enrolled in specific programs, uh, or you have di specific data that you're collecting, uh, you can build an extension that is just that simple, small little piece, can then put those together to create the tracked entity dashboard that actually suits your needs. And there are other places where you might wanna have customizations in data entry for capture or for uh, aggregate data as well. Yeah. The the, the tracked entity uh, the tracked entity dashboard is introduced in basically 238 with the capture application. It's an opt-in functionality. So that's, uh, Marcus mentioned that um, in the what's new presentation on Monday. The extension ability of that is coming soon. That's not uh, quite there yet. So basically being able to, to create a plugin and put that onto that dashboard, but that's coming soon. Um, the question was whether that's there yet um, for those who couldn't hear. Um, lots of other things here, but one of the one of the most interesting, I think, um, is integrated reverse proxy. So this is something where, when you're building an application, a lot of times, as I mentioned on Tuesday, there's a something on the server or some external system that you need to interact with. And so, right now, the 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 most straightforward way to do that is just to have your your application running in the browser talking to that external thing. But that has some challenges because you need to share credentials to be able to access that external service. You're going over the public internet, which maybe isn't the best idea. Um, and you, it's, it's difficult to kind of restrict what different DHS2 users can do in your application to talk to that external system. Maybe they each need to have their own credential with that external system, or you need to store it somewhere, which is problematic in its own right. So this would allow, basically, it's a lightweight way to, um, allow applications to work in uh, with server-side things. Uh, so basically the, the app would continue to be able to talk just to DHIS2, but certain requests would be able to be routed to some external service. Uh, and that DHIS2 would then be able to uh, apply authentication and, and authorization rules to that 
those requests to say only users with this specific authority authority can talk to the go data system that's that it's talking to behind the scenes or whatever that that external system is a custom custom backend service so this is something that's fairly lightweight fairly easy to implement but it a lot it opens up a lot of uh, additional functionality there um and then this is supposed to be events and scheduled uh basically scheduled uh web hooks sort of so this is allowing when something happens in DHS2, allowing an application that's running on the server side to be able to tap into that and say, whenever, uh, right now we have program notifications that can send an SMS or an email when a patient moves to a certain stage in a program, but you might, instead of sending an SMS or an email, you might wanna trigger some workflow in some external system. And so being able to do that when, when something happens in DHS2 or on a schedule to be able to say, I wanna run my uh, interoperability job once a day uh, at 3 a.m. or something like that um, would be, a, 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 again, kind of lightweight way to be able to um, unlock a lot of additional functionality on that server side. Um, yeah, granular app permissions, I talked about uh, standard app configuration and settings management. When you create a new extension or an application, oftentimes, if it's generic, it needs to be configured before it's usable. And so thinking about ways that we can standardize how those applications and extensions are configured, uh, provide the tooling so that somebody that's installing an application always gets the same interface for how they configure it, um, how they the different things they set, where that's stored, how they uh, the application is enabled or disabled based on what uh, whether it's been configured yet, um, could also kind of streamline the um, the workflow and prevent people from needing to reinvent the the wheel of of creating a, a configuration workflow and interface for every single application or extension that they build. Um, bundle documentation and localization, another thing that's very cool that also would allow uh, potentially the separate the installation of a localization or translation of an application from the installation of the app itself. So particularly for core applications, if you we have full coverage for French and Spanish, uh, but maybe our Arabic coverage isn't as good as 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 you would like, or Swahili or whatever whatever language you're uh, you're needing, and you don't want to wait for the next core release of that application, you might be able to install basically just a language pack uh, to translate that to another language. And interestingly, that also allows a particularly uh, interesting type of um, use case localization where you could actually say, I'm going to use the capture application, but I want to kind of rebrand it for uh, education, for example, or for some other use case or some specific thing where you don't want it to be called a tracked entity, you want it to be called a student or something like that. Um, and so you can actually change and you don't want it to be to be called maybe enrollment, you want to be it to be called something else. So you can actually change all of the text in the application without actually developing anything yourself or changing any of those applications. So that could un unlock a lot of uh, sort of making apps able to be more generic and, and reused in different ways. And I'm not gonna talk much about this last one, but there's, there's a few other things that we'd like to move into in the longer term to be able to unlock a lot of this functionality um, through larger architectural changes in making DHS2 more modular allowing it to be extended uh, across both front end and back end and mobile applications and all of that full stack extensions. Um, and additionally, some more control around how you can use the data store and that custom uh, uh, kind of database with schema enforcement and migrations between versions of, of extensions so that you don't have to do all of that again in the browser as it as it currently stands. Anyway, so that that is a, a very quick. Oh, I wanted to talk about this real quick. Um, Scott, I'm sorry, I'm taking up all your time. <laughs> uh, the feedback usage statistics and error reporting, I think, is something that's particularly interesting. Um, this allows the extension developers or the application developers to answer some questions that are currently very difficult to answer, which is after I, I release my application, I put it on the app hub, what happens? Like, how do I know who's using it? How do I know how they're using it? How do I know if they're 
running into errors and it breaking for everyone, I, I don't know today, unless I have a very strong outreach to those users myself. And so giving the uh, ability to basically integrate some of that feedback and those um, answering those questions through uh, tools that the users of those applications are provided to, to give that feedback through the App Hub and through the, the, the DHS2 platform uh, would be helpful there. Um, and then it's also very beneficial for extension users because you can give, uh, you can understand if you, if we're collecting this feedback from users of the application, you can understand who's used this before maybe, who, how has it worked for other people in the past? Um, what is the sustainable plan for an application? So that's passing in, being able to kind of communicate in, in, in more ways with the developer of that application. Uh, and who do I contact if I have a problem? So right now there, there might be an email address somewhere buried on the App Hub, uh, but you, it's, it's not very clear how you engage with the developer of it of an application and particularly how you escalate problems that maybe your users, your end users are seeing in that application and, and escalate those to the developer of the application. Uh, I think this is quite an interesting area of, of exploration as well. With that, I'll turn it over to anybody for questions. I know that was a, a huge, uh, <laughs> that was supposed to be three minutes at the end of my last presentation. So I, I kind of would have rushed through it anyway, but hopefully that was interesting. If anybody has any questions or, wants to say this is a terrible idea or a good idea or things that are particularly exciting, raise your hand now and then I'll turn it over to Scott maybe to talk quickly at the end. Or maybe we can do questions later. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds fine. Okay. You want to talk? Yeah, because yeah, we don't yeah, have much time. We yeah. only have two minutes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to start talking. I don't have slides, so that's good. I do have slides, but I'm not going to put them up. But um, I want to, that's a good slide. Just leave it. That looks nice. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna. It's a hard pivot. Okay, from that, but it's all it's all relevant or related. So, um, we've been we've been building up this app ecosystem, a uh, tons of apps, tons of innovation. You're gonna see some of that later. Really incredible apps, solving really big problems generically. They can be used in any country. You know, apps that are being made that are as good, if not better, than our core apps. Right. Um, coming out of places like UDSM, University of Dar es Salaam, uh, all the HIST networks, uh, PEPFAR, you know, lots and lots and lots of innovation. And so what, so the next question is, what happens to it, right? And we've been conducting interviews with essentially all those people, for-profits, non-profits, HIST groups, ministries. We conducted 15 interviews, interviewed some of the folks in the room here. And we were... I was really praying that someone had some kind of secret about making these apps sustainable. That someone had figured out some kind of model, some kind of business model, for lack of a better word. There wasn't any, literally none. No one had a solution. And so what do we, I mean, we've got all this stuff, we can build apps, but if none of them are sustainable, we're basically just our own platform for pilotitis, right? This is, I think this is kind of like a bit of a gut check moment where we've got to figure out how do you as an app developer manage, and it, you know, some apps don't have to be sustained. Some apps are like one-off projects, things, and you just solve a, you solve a problem, you do it maybe a little bit more custom, fine, no, no worries. But the apps that need, that the community can galvanize around, how do we keep them alive? How do we distribute the support to them? How do we keep a revenue stream? And when I say revenue stream, I think we are somewhat being tied in by the concept of global digital public goods, right? Extra, good, you know, broad sweeping, ex, you know, uh, defining perspective. But, and the core will always be free and open source. But I think we need to get a little bit more creative about how we are positioning our innovations on the peripheries so that they can be sustained. I mentioned it in the last presentation that I did where we asked you know, 15 different organizations how they want their apps to be sustained and all of them said that it has to come back to the core. That's just not gonna happen. I mean, some of them could potentially come back to the core, maybe, but 
that's not a realistic solution. So we've got to come up with some other alternative. And all that being said, we don't have an answer for it right now, right? We are just starting to uh, play with some ideas. There were some ideas suggested. Um, ooh, make it a statement, man. <laughs> there were some ideas suggested. So, I mean, things like um, uh, Austin pointed out, uh, being able to communicate a lot more on the App Hub, having collaborations between multiple uh, parties. Everyone is constantly reinventing how to import data via Excel into DHIS2. It's like five apps a year for the app competition on how to import data via Excel. We have solutions. Well, we need to like work together on it as opposed to working in isolation. Maybe we have one solution that everybody works on. That would be like the dream of open source come to life, right? Um, uh, that's just, and then, and then, so communities of app developers, shared problems, shared solutions, but then also people using those apps, right? So people who are, um, all working towards or all using that import app or something, for example, and maybe they're able to share up the burden of maintaining that app, right? So we need to form collaborations, communication, and we think we need, I think we need to get kind of a little bit more realistic about um, revenue streams, right? So not all apps just have to be put out there and, you know, global good, anybody can use it because clearly there's not really a sustainable model for that, right? Um, so let's think about like bundled services, you know, charge for support. I know these are kind of taboo concepts, but right now we, we need to, we need to be, uh, we need to be creative. We need to explore. Um, so all that to be said, if you have ideas, please, please tell us um, so that we can kind of work through this together. And it's not going to be a top-down thing where University of Oslo kind of says, this is a thing. It's going to be you guys on the front lines who are actually making the app saying, I want to keep this app alive What's and, and trying to innovate and experiment, not just you know in the app itself, but in kind of how, how to keep it going. So if you have ideas, if you have, um, and if there's any way that we can support those ideas, please let us know. The other point is, if you're in this process and you're kind of early days, we want to follow you from like a research perspective. We want like a longitudinal case study from kind of co concept for an app, making an app into release of the app and trying to sustain the app over time. Because right now we're just getting snapshots of many different apps in different places. And it's kind of, we're kind of building this collage of an image, but it's, it'd be really nice to follow a life cycle, a full life cycle. Now, that's all I'm going to say. So just more, we should talk more, as Austin said. Um, now, we are all going to not stop in here, and we're all going to go straight over mm -hmm. to, because it starts at 12. So just go from here now. Can I, can I make one, one comment on the app? On the oh, app yeah, Austin's going to make Sorry. one comment. Yeah. <laughs> one comment on the, on, the, on the app front is that it's also in, uh, important to note that not not every single app needs to be shared and, glo and global, right? So That's there, true. there is a, a huge benefit also to using the, the tools to make it easier for people to just customize their specific instance of DHS2 and their specific workflow, even if no one else will ever use it or if they will never share it with anyone else. So I think there's, uh, that, that is also an, an, an avenue uh, is to make, just use this infrastructure to make it easier to customize a single instance of DHS2, but, we really get to the the network effect of this whole infrastructure for extensibility and DHS2 as a platform if people are sharing and are able to share and sustain the the, the innovations that they're building and and and, and uh, share those with other people and then that other country doesn't need to build the same app that somebody else built which happens today all the time so that's that's where we want to get to and we like to explore the sustainability options for yeah. that and last thing to say there are people who have deep pockets there's money in this community all right we just got to figure out how to get it from them to you through the apps i heard gavi is is just giving up yeah well gavi but even like private the, there's private sector folks in this community who actually have a lot of money and they don't know how to and they want to improve efficiencies and we just need to make sure that what your solutions are on their radar and that they, and it is, you know, uh, everybody's kind of uh, working together. Anyways, okay. So please don't stop here. Just go straight across. Just right across because we're starting from. Okay, thanks. Thank you all. Nice, thanks. Sorry, I didn't leave you much time. Yeah, no worries. 